the Center for Bible Engagement, where they pulled 40,000 uh, p- uh, general population in the U.S. from 8 to 80. And they just wanted to see how we are engaging with Scripture. Right. And they discovered something that actually became kind of the profound discovery of the entire study. It, they weren't even looking for this, and this is kind of became the highlight of the study. Right. Um, when we're in the Scripture one time a week, and that could be church on Sunday. That's pastor saying you open your Bible, we hear the message. One time a week had negligible effect on some key areas of your life. So I'll, I'm going to spell that out more here in a moment. Two times a week, negligible effect. Now at three times a week, there was a blip on the map, like there was a heartbeat. Something happened, again, a heartbeat. Okay. But here was a profound discovery. When we're in the scripture four times a week, it literally spikes off the chart. You would expect that it'd be one, two, th- I mean, there'd be a gradual incline right. on the effect and impact that would have in your life, but it was literally one, two, three, four, something radically happens. Okay, you got my curiosity. To this what, extent. What kind of behavior is being affected? Feeling lonely drops 30%. Wow. Ang- four times a week in the four Bible. Four times a week in the Bible. Okay. Anger issues drop 32%. Uh, bitterness in relationships, marriage, a relationship with your kids, and so on, drops 40%. Alcoholism drops Crazy. 57%. Feeling spiritually stagnant. You know, if there was one area when I'm talking with people that, that they'll be honest about is they just feel spiritually stagnant. Ask them the question, how much time are you spending in the scripture? If they're in the scripture four times a week or more, it drops 60%. Wow. Viewing pornography drops 61%. That's very important. Now, on a flip positive side, sharing your faith jumps 200%. Wow. Because you have a confidence in God's word. And then discipling others jumps 230%. That's, That's amazing right there. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. <clears throat> good. You, yeah, you guys should be awake. You had an extra hour. Um, don't, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of how many people use that extra hour to actually gain it in sleep or just stayed up longer saying, hey, it's not 1130. It's only 1030. Hey, it's not 1230. It's only 1130. Um, I may have been one of those people. Um, <clears throat> so it didn't, didn't gain a whole lot, but um, excited, excited for what God is doing. <clears throat> um, and so we've got this reading challenge that we started. You are not too, too far behind, so don't worry about that. Don't be stressed uh, about that. If you missed it, we started it uh, last week. Um, today is day six, I believe. We're on day day six today. Um, and so we've got these, these, uh, these little uh, brochure things, these little handouts, and we'll have them um, at the uh, at the back, when people uh, <clears throat> when you guys leave, the ushers will have them there for you, and you can grab one of them. And it actually has a checklist. It tells you what chapters to read, and you can actually check off each day so you know you've caught up with it. Um, and now, if you've done the reading challenge, if you've been a part of that so far, um, <clears throat> and a few people have messaged me, and they're just like, "There's so many names." Um, yes, they, they they decided to start us off with the lists um, in this <laughs> in this order. So yes, there are a lot of names, and we're going through and reading a lot of genealogies. And uh, trust me, it, it gets it gets better. It, it changes um, from there. I told some people, I said, when you get to those lists and you struggle with how to pronounce names, how the name, I said, just go to the Bible app and just play it and just read along with it and let it read it to you. Um, and that kind of thing, and it does make it a little bit easier, makes it a little bit uh, easier to handle. But anyway, so we're doing this challenge, and it's exciting to do this challenge as a church because of what it means for us, not only as a church, but really what it means for us individually, like you saw in that video there, the impact of spending time in the Word regularly. And it's interesting to note, like they, they found in the study, that we're not talking one day, two day, three day, but there's something happens when we get to that fourth day. When we're in the word that fourth day, there's something happens. And they only talk about the fourth day. They don't get into what happens five days, six days, seven days a week. And that's what we're doing. That is the plan of this. The the purpose of this plan is that we're in the word seven days a week for the entire year, 365 um, days, the entire Bible. And there's no way in the world that if we stick through this as a, as a church body, if you stick through this as an individual, there's no way in the world at the end of this year. When we come back <clears throat> to the beginning of November, the end of October next year, there's no way in the world there's not going to be an impact or not going to be a change in your lives. So we just finished up Fall of the Hero. 
And for some of you, maybe you were like me. I walked in, and I was here when these things were, were torn down, and I've been in, and I was in the building yesterday, but this morning it was just weird to walk out of the sanctuary and then, like, like where's the stuff on the walls? And then to walk back in here and not see all the things on the walls. But it was a, it was a great series and a great opportunity to look at some, some, uh, some stories, look at some people in Scripture and their connection to us and their stories and how their stories connected to us. And so we talked about Lot. And are you ready to be free from fear? And Peter, that Jesus not only offers us forgiveness, but also restoration. So are you ready to stop and to return? We talked about Esther. Will you do the right thing no matter what? We talked about Annas. What does your house, what does your heart look like? And finally, Aaron, will you be obedient? Will you be obedient? And I told you and I warned you guys that that, that O word is going to come up a whole lot. It's going to come up a whole lot as we end this year and we get into 2023. <clears throat> um, that O word is going to come up a lot and, and, and that, that call to be obedient to him. And we're going to see that as we go jump in to our next series on Hosea. Our next series on Hosea. And we see Hosea come onto the scene in the book named after him. <clears throat> we see Hosea come on the scene, Hosea chapter 1, <clears throat> in the first part there, verse 1. The, Lord, the word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of B or I. <clears throat> and so that is where we see it start. That is where we see the story of Hosea start is literally <clears throat> the word of the Lord coming to him, Hosea being called. A.W. Tozer says this. He says, the Bible recognizes no faith that does not lead to obedience, nor does it recognize any obedience that does not spring from faith. The two are on opposite sides of the same coin. So we are going to focus on the story of Hosea, and it is the story of the relentless love of God. But we're going to see something that comes alongside that and that comes with it is this call to obedience, this call to be obedient to what God has for us, this call to be obedient to what God is calling us to do. And at times we're going to see, especially in the story of Hosea, that sometimes that call to obedience can be a little extreme. It can take us way beyond our comfort zone. But we're also going to see through Scripture that that call to obedience is also there is a foundational, there is a very simple, there is a very crucial call to obedience that is there in front of all of us. And so we're going to talk about Hosea and we're going to talk about the example. We're going to talk about rejected love's result and then the takeaway for us. Now, Hosea itself has, I believe, 14 chapters, and we're not going to go through and read every single chapter, but some of, some of the parts, some of the things that we talk about in this series, we will focus on and spend a chunk of time on some of these chapters because there's just some significant, important things in there. And so I want to jump into the example, and we've got to look at Hosea chapter 1 because there's so much that we see in there. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, ready? Now, this is very different from what the Lord said to all other prophets, okay? This is very different than what we see. This is a very different start of a conversation, and you'll notice this as we go through reading the Bible, and you read Jeremiah, and you read, you know, uh, 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 Micah, and you read you know, all these other prophets, prophets, and you see their stories, many of their stories start with God showing up and telling them something, okay? So that pattern is going to be very, is going to be common. We're going to see that pattern a lot over the next year as we go through our reading challenge. But what you're going to notice, what you're going to see is that most of them don't quite get this kind of first introduction, okay? This first introduction is very different. It's what really just separates the story of Hosea from so many more. And so the word of the Lord comes to, God comes to Hosea, and this is what he tells him. Ready? Go take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. Now listen, there are prophets that God came to and said, hey, this is the word for you. I'm about to destroy this city. Hey, this is the word for you. I'm about to punish these people. Hey, this is the word for you. I'm about to do some rough and some tough and some not so good things. And you read those and you're like, man, I would really stink to have to be that person. <laughs> Till you read Hosea. Till you read Hosea and you hear that this is, this is what God tells them, to go and take a prostitute as a wife, and to have kids with her. 
Ready? <clears throat> because the land, because my people have prostituted themselves by forsaking me. See, Hosea plays, and, and Hosea's life becomes an example that becomes very significant and very po- important for us to look at. So he went and he took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel, for in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put to end the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. She conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, call her no mercy, for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horse or by horsemen. When she had weaned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, call his name not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God, and the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall go up from the land of from the land, for the great shall be the day of Jezreel. And so this is just chapter one. And in chapter one, we see the, 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 the issue at hand, and you would say, my goodness, what in the world is going on in this? We see the issue at hand is that God tells Hosea, as my prophet, this is what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to go and marry a prostitute and go and have children <coughs> with her and understand something, that your life, that your relationship with her, that her life, that all of this is going to be an example of what the, of the relationship of the, that, the, that the nation of Israel has with me. Your life is going to be an example. It is going to take, take my relationship with Israel and all that they do and all that they've done, and you're going to be an example of it. People will look at your life literally for the rest of time and the rest of humanity. They will look at your life, and it will be an example of what Israel has done with me. Can you imagine? Can you imagine I mean, think of, think of the judge Gideon, and, God, and an angel shows up, and Gideon is cowering and hiding and trying to make some food, and the angel says, and calls him mighty warrior, and Gideon's like, who, me? <laughs> I'm the smallest of the smallest of the smallest. <laughs> I'm the smallest in my family. My family is the smallest in our tribe, and our tribe is the smallest in all of Israel, and you're calling me mighty warrior. I mean, think of the shock there. Think of the shock that, 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 you know, that, that Mary had when the angel appeared to her and said, hey, you're going to conceive the son, a, a son, you're going to have a child, and not only are you going to have a child, it is going to be the Messiah. Think of the shock there. All throughout Scripture, there are these moments where God shows up, and it's a shock. <laughs> it's a stretch. It's a struggle. It's, 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 there, there's, there's, whoa, what, what are you doing in my life? But man, I can't imagine, I can't imagine how that, that prayer time between Hosea and God went <clears throat> when God came to him and said, hey, this is the plan I have for you. See, Hosea was asked by God to literally live his life as an example of the sin of his people. And Hosea was going to experience what God has experienced Hosea's life, Hosea himself was going to experience what God had experienced by the nation of Israel. Hosea 1.4, we've seen the Lord said, call his name Jezreel, which means God sows. Even his children. You think it's bad enough to say God has called him to marry a prostitute. God has called him to marry something like that. But even his children would be an example of the relationship with God in Israel. Even his own children weren't going to escape the example that God was setting. The first son, we call Jezreel, which means God sows, and we would see that that, that, that son would be killed, and, and that son would, would spark uh, 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 what God was, was going to do and, and, and going to do and what was going to happen in Israel. But then she conceives a daughter in verse 6. She conceived a daughter, and the Lord said to him, call her no mercy. I mean, think of that. 
<clears throat> you know, we call our kids names because they're, it's a family name. <clears throat> we had a grandfather. We had an uncle. We had a cousin. This is our parents' name. It's a name that has been in our family. We call them that name. Why? Because it carries honor. It carries legacy. Or there's a name that we just really have liked for a long time, and so and that's the name we pick. Or, you know, we spend time, and you go through, and you look up me- names and their meanings and your stuff, and you're like, ooh, I like this one. I like, I like what this one means. This is significant, and so I want to name. Let's name our kid this. Can you imagine sitting down and having a conversation with <clears throat> your spouse, and one of you is pregnant, and it's, you know, it, it's that baby name conversation time, and it's like, oh, I've got a name. Let's call our child hypocrite because God's people have been a hypocrite in their relationship with him. I mean, just just think of what would go through the mind of the other person like, okay, that's great. Let's keep going on. (laughs) Let's keep going down the list. Great. That's a good one. How many vetoes do we get? I'm vetoing that one. He's a daughter, and the name that God tells him to call her, no mercy, because I will have no mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. (laughs) Because of Israel's continued sin, they would be shown no mercy from God. In Hosea 1.9, he has another child, he has another son. And his name... (laughs) His name is not my people. Not my people. Can you imagine that growing up and you're, you know, you're you're the first time you're in you're in school and you walk into preschool together and everybody's introducing themselves and there's David and there's John and there's Steve. And there's not my people. Hi, not my people, welcome to class today. Not my people, that's an interesting name. Why is that your name? Well, because you're not my people and I'm not your God. That's that's why God named me that. God named me that because our nation is a nation of rebels and a nation that has sinned against God and has cursed God and we're all, uh, God looks at us all as prostitutes and so my name is a reminder to all of you. Think about how that would go down in a job interview. And yet, this is, and this is what he does, and, he, and his name is not my people, for you are not my people, ready? And then this one, oh, this one stings, and I am not your God. My only response to that, it'll go up on the screen, is ouch. <laughs> for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Now, it's easy to say that God is horrible because of this. It is easy to look at this and say, I cannot believe that God would have these kids name this. I cannot believe that God would ask Hosea to do this. See, this is just more proof that God is mean and, and, and grumpy and nasty. This is just more proof that I want nothing to do with God. I want nothing to do with church, nothing to do with bi- the Bible. Yet how many of us should have our names changed to who we really are? Can you imagine? Can you imagine if God called you? Not by the name your parents gave you, but by the name of that sin you struggle with. Can you imagine if God called you by, by, by the, the, the issue you struggle with or the area you struggle with or the area you continue to rebel against him? Can you imagine if, if, if that became the, 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 the spotlight? In this situation, God is using this family and he's using these people to shine a light on the situation, the circumstances that are going on in the nation of Israel, and that is not something to take lightly, nor is it something to get angry at God about, nor is it something to get mad at God about, but realize that what God is doing with this family is he is using them as an example to do what? To call Israel back to him. To call Israel back to him. So that's the example. Let's talk about Rejected love's result, and we're going to talk about <clears throat> Hosea chapter 2. Hosea chapter 2, 6, verse 6. Therefore I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. See, God is using Gomer as the example, the wife of Hosea and her sin and her prostitution. As she And throughout the story, what do we see? We see she spends time with Hosea. He takes care of her. He loves on her. And then what does she do? She goes right back to the streets. She goes right back to the sin that she was accustomed to. And then what happens? Things go on. She comes back to Hosea. They, they patch things up. And, and then sure enough, she goes right back to the same stuff again. 
In Hosea chapter 2, we see God talking about not just Gomer. He's talking about the nation of Israel. I will hedge her up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. That God was going to do, was only going to let Israel go so far away from him. That God was only going to let Israel get so far away from him. Israel's going to run away from me. And I know it's coming, and I'm going to hedge, and I'm going to do what I need to do to try to keep them from going too, to not try to, to keep them from going too far. Even if this seems tough, this should be comforting to us. This should be comforting to us. To know that we, we serve a God that loves us enough that at times he will put roadblocks in the way and say, no, 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 you're going too far. No, 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 this way. No, 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 not that way, too far. Think about uh, Psalm 23. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. And you say, how could David say that? David knows what a rod and staff is for. And part of it, yes, might be to help pull a sheep out of a, uh, and put a lamb out of a tough situation. And part of it might be to use to defend against wild animals and animals that are attacking. But also part of that rod and that staff was also to knock some sense into those sheep. Sometimes that rod and that staff were used to like, nah, -uh, not that way, get back over this way. And sheep are stubborn. So you know the shepherd wasn't out there with his stick going, okay, come on, guys. Come on, let's go this way. No, 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 a little too far. Come here, buddy. Tap, 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 tap. No. You know, every now and then that shepherd had to take the crook of that, that can reach out and grab a hold of one of them sheep by the neck and Yank that thing back over so it learns, hey, if I go that way, that hurts a little bit. If I go too far this way, that's going to sting a little bit. Even at times, the sheep, when they were young, those that continued to rebel and run away, even at times, a shepherd would break their legs and carry them so the sheep learned to rely on the shepherd and not run off on their own. See, even, even if this seems tough, it should be comforting to us. Hosea 2, 8, and she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, the oil, who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. How often do we not see how God is blessing us? How often do we not see how God is blessing us? This is, it's November, right? Now it's all about Thanksgiving, and then those psychos of you that are all about Christmas already, <clears throat> settle down. You've got time. It's coming. But this month is all about Thanksgiving now, right? Halloween ended, October is done, and what do we do? Boom, it's Thanksgiving, and there are people that are doing 31 days or 30 days of thankfulness, and every day they post a picture of something they're thankful, and they say something else, and for the whole month, talk about what you're thankful for. But the truth is, that's exactly what, what, what doesn't happen in our lives so often. We wait until Thanksgiving time to say what we're thankful for. Okay, the family's around the table. What were you thankful for this year? Talk about what, what happened this year that you're thankful for. Barb gets up here and does announcements, and what does, she, what does she do? She asks you, hey, what are you thankful for? And yet oftentimes we don't think about what we're thankful for all the rest of the year. In Hosea 2a, he talks about how I was the one that provided. I was the one that gave Israel all of this stuff, and you know what they did with it? They used it to worship other gods. How often do we not see how God is blessing us? None of us would ever use his blessing the wrong way, right? None of us would ever do that. None of us would ever take what God has blessed us with and use it to worship the enemy. We would never do that. None of us would ever take what God has given us and what God has provided for us and turn around and try to act like we're the ones that have earned this, to try to act like we're the ones that have accomplished, to try to act like, hey, this is all about me and I've done this all and look at the kingdom I've set up for myself. None of us would ever do that. Hosea 2, 13, and I will punish her for the feast, <clears throat> for the feast days of Baals, when she burned offerings to them and adorned herself with the rings and jewelry and went after her lovers and forgot me, declares the Lord. See, what did the nation of Israel do? They celebrated, they gave offerings to other gods, and they forgot God. They celebrated, gave offerings to other gods, and they forgot God. See, when we see what Israel was doing, it really makes sense that they would be punished. In chapter 1, we're like, oh, my goodness, God is so mean. He's so angry. See, this is what I'm telling you about. 
<clears throat> See, we shouldn't even read the Old Testament because that's angry God. Can we just go back to, to, to sweet Jesus? Can we go back to, you know, let's just hold hands and sing some nice, sweet church songs because, man, Pastor Nate, you can't keep preaching about the, on the Old Testament because that's just mean and angry God. Poor Israel, it's not fair to them. What did they ever do? Well, now we know. We didn't have to get very far. Chapter, chapter 2 tells us right away what they did. They celebrated, gave offerings to other gods, and forgot God. They forgot their God. Understand something, too, is that the nation of Israel wasn't just like any other nation. They were God's chosen. They were called for a time to be an example. To be an example of what? To be an example of God. To be an example of God's way. Their customs were supposed to reflect God and be different from the world around them. Their behaviors were supposed to reflect God and be different from those around them. Their lives were to reflect God and be different from those around them. Everything that they did was supposed to reflect God and be different than the nations around them. And what did Israel do time and time again? Act just like the world and not like God and not do what God had called them to do. Time and time again. And you say, it's a lot, it's a lot harder to, be, to now look and say, well, Israel really didn't deserve to be punished. Oh, they deserve far more than what God had planned for them and what God had given them in different situations and different times. So let's talk about the takeaway. What does this mean for us? And so we're going to talk about the answer. Hosea 2, verse 21 to 23. And in that day, I will answer, declares the Lord, I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth. And the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, the oil, and they shall answer Jezreel. And I will sow for her myself in the land. And I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. See, we talk about God being mean, and this is insane, and this story is ridiculous, and I can't believe that God would ask Hosea to do this, and all of this stuff, and yet what do we see? Even as God is, is, is declaring judgment, even as God is declaring his anger, even as God is preparing punishment for the nation of Israel, what do we still see? We don't have to get to Hosea chapter 12 or 13 or 14. We don't have to get to the end of the story to see that God continues to love his people and continues to call them and continues to care for them. And what do we see? I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. See, God punished Israel for their wrongdoing and yet still loved them and still was willing to restore them. And still was willing to restore them. So maybe as a church, maybe as followers of Christ, Maybe she, we should change how we see correction. Maybe we should change how we see correction. Imagine a church, imagine the church world where, where correction is normal, where correction is a part of what the church does, where correction is a part, and correction is not only is it, is it normal, but it's celebrated it's welcomed because Scripture tells us that iron sharpens iron. It's welcomed. Why? Because Scripture tells us to come together and do what? Confess your sins to one another. It's welcomed. Why? Because Scripture tells us that there is healing and forgiveness when what? When we come together and we're honest with each other and, we, and, we, and we're corrected and we're, and we're built up and led forward with each other. Can you imagine what it would mean? Can you imagine what it would mean when, 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 we, when, when something would happen and maybe we would struggle with it, but we would learn and we would grow and we would take that correction and grow for imagine what the church could look like where we weren't so scared of correction. This is not in your notes, but I added this. Hebrews 12, 5 to 6. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastens every son who he receives. 
Don't be weary. Don't be weary when God corrects you, especially knowing you deserve worse. <laughs> Let's just be real about it. You get in trouble and you get a spanking from God, understand something, that you probably deserve far worse. You did deserve far worse than that. Don't be weary when God corrects you, especially knowing you deserve worse. God's correction means love, and it means that God has better for you and desires better for you. God's correction means love, and it means that God has better and desires better for you. It's funny because as, as, as a kid growing up, and growing up in, in a church that had a, a pretty significant children's and youth ministry, and it was funny because we would hear this verse quoted to us when we were misbehaving in church. When we were fooling around in church, we used to have a youth section, and so all the teenagers on, in, in service sat in the same section. Okay, don't know if that was the wisest thing, but that's what happened. At some point, they had to break up the youth section. It was no longer allowed because the youth section, they put them in the front, the front corner. It was one of the sides. Actually, it started on this side, and then it moved to this side. It moved around the church, but they put it in the front because they figured, well, in the front, the kids are going to behave. No, in the front, they were just more of a distraction because not everybody saw them, <clears throat> all right? And those were the days, you know, where, where you would look across the sanctuary and you see your parents staring at you. And you were just like, I hope they forget this before we get home. I hope they forget this before we get home. Because you knew it meant a whooping. And so the youth section got disbanded. And so we all had to go back to our parents and sit with our parents. <clears throat> Some of us found salvation in children's ministry. So we went and go joined and helped out in the children's ministry. I'll go serve in the nursery. <clears throat> so I don't have to sit in there and I don't have to sit with my parents and potentially get in trouble and whatever. But then over time, some of us ended up back in the sanctuary. You know what started happening? We started in the back now. One of us sitting with the parents, hey, can Billy sit with me? Okay, sure. So now Billy sat with me. And then it was, oh, can so-and-so sit with me? And before you knew it, there was five, six, there was a new youth section formed. But now we were in the back. So you know what that meant? A whole lot of trouble. And you know what the response, every time we got in trouble, you know what the response was? The Lord, for the Lord disciplines those he loves. And because we love you, we've got to discipline you. And I grew up hating this verse. For the Lord disciplines the ones he loves. Okay, well, mom and dad, stop loving me, please. Okay? For like a, for a few seasons, parents in church, just stop loving your teenagers and just let us do our thing. No, for the Lord tastes, he loves, he disciplines, he punishes. So this hurts me more than it hurts you. And then I had my own kids. And all of a sudden, one of my sweet angels that never does anything wrong, the one time they ever slipped up, and I'm like, now I got to spank you. Now I got to gotta yell at you. Now you're going to get in trouble. And in my mind, all I can think of was the Lord disciplines the ones he loves. And I'm going, I'm doing this, Micaiah, because I love you. <laughs> and in my mind, I'm thinking about that. I'm doing this because it loves you. But you know what we've done? That we've turned correction into this horrible thing where it's, 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 it's either abusive, it's embarrassing, it's offensive, rather than realizing that correction means love. And when God corrects us, it's because he loves us and he has better for us. Jeremiah 7, 23, but his command I gave them, obey my voice and I will be your God and you shall be my people and walk in all the way I commanded you that it may be well with you. See, proof of what God is to you is shown in your obedience. Proof of, what, of, of who God is to you is shown in your obedience. And you know what? Blessing comes from obedience. Blessing comes from obedience. You ain't going to find a whole lot of blessed people <clears throat> that, are, that, that have a relationship with God who aren't being obedient to him. Now, how that blessing comes, that's, you know, depends on where, what, what side of, of, of scriptural translation you're on. You can, we can argue that all kinds of ways. But scripture tells us that blessing comes to those who are obedient. To those who are obedient. How that blessing comes, that's in God's hands. But it comes in those that are obedient. 1 Samuel 15, 22. And Samuel said, has the Lord, has, has, 
great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. Obedience over sacrifice? Really? That's what Scripture is saying? Obedience over sacrifice? But understand something. If mankind was obedient to God, then why would there be a need for sacrifice? Let's go all the way to the beginning. Let's go all the way to the garden. If Adam and Eve were obedient to God, there would be no need for sacrifice. That is why obedience over sacrifice. That's why obedience over sacrifice. Sacrifice is a result of disobedience. Sacrifice is a result of disobedience. If I'm obeying him and I'm doing what God has called me to do, you know what you'll find? You'll find that there's no need for sacrifice. You say, yeah, but what if God calls you to give up something? Well, it's not a sacrifice. You're being obedient. God asked me to do it. I'm being obedient. Here it is, God. I'm not losing anything. I'm being obedient to you. You're not taking anything from me. You're not robbing from me, God. I'm being obedient to you. Here it is. It wasn't mine in the beginning. I'm being obedient to you. And remember, we talked about this at the beginning. God is mean. God is tough. In the Old Testament, God is beating everybody up. We just want some Jesus, right? We even sang this song, all I need is Jesus. Okay, that's all I want. All I want is him. Here, take the world, right? Just give me Jesus. We're ready here, Matthew 7, 21. Here's Jesus. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. (laughs) But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So much for nice Jesus that just hugs everybody. See, calling Jesus Lord doesn't mean he actually, he is actually your Lord. I can call him Lord all I want. Just like I can call anybody anything that I want. And I can say whatever I want, but it doesn't actually make him Lord. I can turn and I can call Austin. We can start calling him King Austin. Sorry. I was just apologizing to his wife because this is about to go to his head. I'll get some messages about this later. But we could all start calling him King Austin. Oh, there he is, King Austin. On Facebook, he can change his name, King Austin. We can start mentioning, there's King, King Austin. How you doing, King Austin? Hey, it was just your birthday. Happy birthday, King Austin. We could all start doing that. You know what? It means nothing. Because we can call him King Austin, but guess what? He ain't actually king. See, I can call him Lord. I can say that Jesus is Lord, but that doesn't actually mean that he's my Lord. Action, obedience proves those words. Action and obedience proves those words. So Hosea is a story of love, but it's also a story of obedience. The obedience of Hosea and the disobedience of the people of God. So here's our question for today. Here's how we end with, what is God calling you to do? What is God calling you to do? And some of you may answer and say, love him. Well, he wants us to love him. Greatest commandment, right? Love God. But how? How? How how do we love him? How do we show that obedience to him? We love others. We share Jesus. And we make disciples. Now understand something. That's not just my job. That's not just Jenny's job. That's not just Shannon's job. That's not just Pastor Stephanie's job. That's not just somebody leading a ministry, somebody on a ministry team. So that's for all of us. What is God calling you to do? You, 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 you. What is God calling you to do? It's to love him. How? By loving others, by sharing Jesus and making disciples. So here's the, here's the question, the final question. Are you doing what God has called you to do? Are you doing what God has called you to do? I'm not talking about 
starting up some ministry. I'm not talking about <clears throat> something big. I'm not talking about, okay, well, we got to pray because I don't know if God wants me to help with children or help with this. or help. I'm not talking about all of that stuff. What I'm talking about is that the basic foundation of who we are in Christ, we are called to do what? To love others, to share Jesus, and to make disciples. Every single one of us is called to do that. Don't worry about the next piece. Don't worry about the public stuff. Don't worry about all that other stuff. That will all come. Are you doing what he's called you to do? At the core, at the basic foundation, when was the last time you shared Jesus with somebody? When was the last time you took somebody under your wing and helped train them up and you say, yeah, but I don't know what I'm doing. Well, find somebody who knows less of what they're doing than you and at least get them to where you are. And if you don't keep growing, pass them on to somebody else. But at least love on somebody and get them to where you are. And you know what? Then find somebody who's where you want to be and work with them and, 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 and spend time with them and grow with them. And hopefully they'll be doing the right thing and they'll disciple you up to where they are. At the core foundation of who we are in Christ, this is what we all should be doing. So are you doing what he has called you to do? Song is going to play like it does. We'll have a time of prayer and reflection. And, and the song is actually just, it's about obedience. It's a challenge to us to be obedient. So as the song plays, just look at yourself and where you are and go down to that basic core. God, am I being obedient to you? Am I loving others? Am I sharing Jesus? Am I making disciples? And if that's not what I'm doing, then challenge me and help me to begin to do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Hosea and the example that he is. And I pray, God, that none of us ever have to be an example to the degree of Hosea. But, God, I also pray, God, that we would be an example to the people around us of who you are and what you've called us to do. So I pray today, God, that we would have open hearts and open minds to be honest to be transparent with ourselves and with you. But at the core, at the basic, at the foundation, at the most simplest of what we're called to do, God, that we would answer yes or no. And if the answer is no, God, then help us change so that we would love others, so that we would share the gospel, we would share you so they would, we would come alongside people and help build them up and make disciples to follow you. We thank you, God, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.